You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here's your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. Good morning. I'm Julie Broadway, president at the American Horse Council. And I'm Megan Arsman, communications and marketing specialist for the American Horse Council. And you are listening to the special monthly American Horse Council episode of Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network for November 7th, 2023, episode seven. Good morning, horse world. It's time to hear from the American Horse Council in this monthly episode of Horses in the Morning. Thank you for tuning in with us this morning. Julie, you and I have a lot in common when it comes to horses. And one of them is that we come from a background of showing horses. Yes, that's right. I grew up uh, doing some trail riding and a breeder and a number of things, but spent a lot of time in the show ring, love to show. I'm a little competitive. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I I, uh, your husband showed shared a picture with us and uh, the intense look on your face in the show ring. And he says, I don't know how you got how you girls enjoy this when you look that way. And I said, it's called focus. It's called intense focus. But yeah, I'm the, I'm the same way. Grew up showing open shows in 4-H high school rodeos and stuff and 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 uh, and all. And definitely I enjoy it. I enjoy showing horses in the competitions because I feel that it helps me become a better person and I learn how to be a better horsewoman. And but it's always been it's it's been in the forefront of my mind. And I'm trying to do this with my own daughter now who is eight and showing miniature horses, um, you know, keeping the welfare of the horse in 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 as number one, it's not about winning the blue ribbon. It's about taking care of your horse and showing it to its best abilities and, and making sure that you're having fun and that your horse is enjoying what you're doing and and all. And so I think, I think that's really important for everybody to keep in mind. And there's nothing like the fierceness of competition, but it's always been instilled that the horse comes first. So that's why I'm intrigued to talk with our guests for this episode. Julie, will you do the honors of telling our listeners about winning with horses? Yeah. So we first want to give a shout out to Trafalgar Books, uh, Trafalgar Square Books, because they introduced us to our guest today, which is Shelly and Adam, who are the authors of a book called Winning with Horses. And so here's just a little bit of a context for our listeners. Um, Is it possible to simultaneously be passionate about winning an equestrian sport and about the welfare of the horses? So Adam and Shelly share their keys to success and the struggles and celebrations that have taught them along the way uh, through the lens of their disparate and yet synchronized experience in the intense realm of world-class equestrian sport. So they explore a lot of topics of concern and things worth considering. They range from the role of natural training methods and horse-human communication to um, options offered by therapeutic alternatives, best steps when preparing the human and the horse for competition, Um, and some of the things that we don't like to think about, like the inevitable retirement reality that sometimes comes as part of this. So we're really excited about having them with us today. Turn your love of horses into savings with equine discounts through the NTRA. Purchase through equine discounts and receive great savings on well-known brands like John Deere, Sherwin-Williams, Big Ass Fans, Farmers Insurance, and Office Depot. Join thousands of other equine members and support companies that give back to the industry we all love. Call 866-678-4289 or visit equinediscounts.com to start saving today. So that brings us to our guests, the authors of the book, Winning with Horses. Adam Snow was a professional polo player for 34 years, whose career highlights include winning two U.S. Open titles, competing in the Argentine Open in 1998 and 2004, winning Best Plain Pony prizes for his horses, and twice being named Player of the Year. He was inducted into the Polo Hall of Fame in 2014. 
now retired from polo, he's giving back to his beloved sport by coaching and mentoring, writing, and announcing polo games for television. Adam grew up in Hamilton, Massachusetts, and received a degree from Yale University, where he also played ice hockey and lacrosse. And Dr. Shelley Onderdonk was born and raised in San Mateo, California, on the other side of the country. She did her undergraduate studies at Yale and received her doctorate of veterinary medicine at the University of Georgia. She has continued her medical education through the International Veterinary Acupuncture Society and the Chi Institute. Dr. Shelley's integrative veterinary practice, which has been active since 1998, incorporates the best of Western medicine, acupuncture, manual therapy, equine sports science, and rehabilitation for the benefit of her patients. She is an avid environmentalist, writer, writer, and yogini. Dr. Shelley and Adam met in Yale, met at Yale and were married in 1989. They've since made Aiken, South Carolina, home where they're where they are parents to their three sons, and manage New Haven Farm, as well as written two books together: Polo Life, Horses, Sport, Ten, and Zen, and of course, Winning with Horses. Dr. Shelley and Adam, thank you very much for joining us. This is a great topic as equestrians are starting to reevaluate their 2023 show year and they're preparing for next year already. So thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. Great. Hey, I bet the weather is beautiful in Aiken today. You know, we're based in Washington, D.C., and we have a nice, should be fall day, but it's really kind of warm. And, and I bet it would be a great day to be outside and playing some polo in Aiken. <laughs> It's gorgeous here. And actually, I'm getting to go play some chuckers after we get off the phone, after our Zoom call. But it's uh, 75 and sunny. Uh, I'm, I'm envious. Jealous. Uh. Okay, well, let's get started. So tell us a little bit about what influenced this book. How did, how did it come to be? What, what was the impetus for all of this? Well, we really wanted to answer this question of, is it possible to be simultaneously passionate about winning in equestrian sport and also about the welfare of the horses. And this question really came to the forefront in our minds after our first book. And really, we come down pretty strongly on the fact that our story is an explicit acknowledgement that doing good for the horse is also good for results in the competitive arena. And we wanted to explain how we do that and let other people try to emulate it. That. And for both of us, we're always searching and innovating for new ideas, trying to learn from everyone. Um, but one of the sort of foundations is first thinking about the natural way to make innovations and proceeding from there. Great. Great. That, okay. Yeah. That, I can see that resonating with a lot of people, um, not just readers of your book, but others who are always trying to think outside the box and also think about ways to be innovative and how they incorporate different strategies into coming up with a winning formula. So excellent. So whether it's, um, you know, the idea of natural horsemanship, of making the wrong thing difficult and the right thing easy, or trying to play my horse is barefoot, learning how to do trims. Um, we're now uh, practicing regenerative agriculture practices during the winter time so that the horses have some cover crops to graze on. But these are just a few of the examples of um, when we can keep it natural, um, we've found a lot of success with those techniques. That is really cool. And when you're talking about regenerative agriculture crops, um, what, are you, what are you talking about? So we just rented the cedar last week for three days, and we put a cocktail of seeds on our pastures, which um, is a combination of legumes, several types of clover, mm -hmm. cold weather grasses, as well as hairy vetch and um, chicory, daikon radish, daikon chicory, radish. flax. And it's kind of a win-win, which is something that we talk about in our books. This is actually giving the horses something to forage on during the winter. So it's kind of- Which I love seeing because I love it when the horses have their heads down and are relaxed in, <laughs> yep. you know, a grazing type of social environment. To me, that's like pasture therapy. So they always do that in the summertime here with our good grass, but in the wintertime, we've always had to sort of feed them hay. And so then they're not eating, you know, all day long. So, so this yeah, but we have the horses happy. We're improving our soil health. 
and we're cutting down on our alfalfa cost at the start of the winter. So it's sort of that's huge an example of what we call a win-win. Well, in the description of that cocktail, as you called it, sounds if I was a horse, it sounds really yummy. All those <laughs> ingredients sound like things that I would really enjoy eating. <laughs> a nice salad. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Well, evolutionarily, that's like one of those things. Like horses naturally really evolved to eat a lot of different things and be foragers. And we put them in stalls and then we feed them two things or something, you know, and it's not really the way that they're meant to be. Yeah. And it wasn't the reason, but if we don't have anything in the fridge, we can always go out in the pasture. <laughs> <laughs> salad greens for our salad. <laughs> there That's you a- go. A twofer. <laughs> <laughs> so Adam, I Adam and Dr. Shelley, I always like when I hear um personal examples of when you're taking on a new mindset and you're taking you're taking on a new competitive mindset and seeing the results. Um, can you share a story or can you share an example of horse of a horse that you know or horses maybe that have made improvements with this new mindset that you are trying to get across in your book? So I'll start well, we both sort of have answers to that, but I'll start with mine is that um, I mean it's not necessarily a new for me now it's an old mindset, but when I mm-hmm. first started acupuncture training, it was a new mindset. And so that was in 1998. I graduated from veterinary school in 97. And then I started my acupuncture training and it was a really new mindset. And what I evolved into doing is really thinking about horses health more preventatively and really trying to get in um, before the crisis. And it's, that's a very, um, very true with the, the sports medicine horses and the, mm-hmm. and the high performance athletes, especially. So. Um, I've just seen countless um, now, you know, 25 years later, um, numbers of horses that benefit from that um, more integrative approach to medicine Mm. and, um, and with the idea of like making small changes early versus having to make, you know, huge adjustments later. Mm. And from my perspective, I was always looking for a competitive edge. So I would want to innovate to try new things that could, enhance my partnership with the horses that I was playing. And one story came to mind. I had bought a mare named Amy. um, And she was very nice. She was like older, 10 years old, I think when I bought her nine or 10. But she would turn with her shoulder inside and leave her head to the outside. And I remember working with somebody here in Aiken, Julie Robbins, who I think did a Pirelli certification course and is a natural horsemanship person on the ground and she was teaching me to do a one rein stop in just a halter and a lead rope and get Amy to do a one rein stop and break over behind as a way to sort of get her following her nose. And this was just at a walk and a trot. It's not like schooling at a gallop out on the schooling field. And that translated almost immediately to her on the playing field, just having her whole body in the shape of the turn that we were making, which is what I wanted. And that mare, a year and a half later, two years later, won Best Playing Pony of the U.S. Open as one as one of the all-time favorite three best horses I've ever played. And I feel like that little, you know, I don't know if that's an innovation or... Well, it's your willingness or our willingness to sort of, at that time, that was a relatively new concept for Adam. So you know, try something different, like get somebody in a natural horsemanship trainer who we didn't really know that well, um, and see if she can help, you know. And -hmm. the other thing consistent with that is recently, we had an opportunity to have Pat Pirelli here with his horses for a week or two. And um, he said something that Adam, the, the process doesn't always have to look like the product. And What he meant is like in the polo world, a lot of people school their horses before they play them like they're on the polo field. And um, he was saying, you don't have to pretend you're on the polo field when you're schooling. Think about something that could make them supple, happy, feel good as a way to get them to performing their best. And I think that that um, rang true and resonated with my story about Amy. Of, yeah. uh, the process yeah. doesn't have to look like the product. And it's particularly true with horses that, you know, not might not be so true with really young horses that you're still training them to do their job. 
But for horses that are on the cusp of knowing their job, or certainly the older ones who do have the appropriate training, it's really trying to get them with you and in a partnership. And, and so that's where path words just really, really ring true to me, where you're trying to just make them um, physically and mentally um, prepared and happy. And that doesn't have to be um, grinding or drilling or anything like that. Right. Yeah. I'm reminded of a friend who used to say, they all need some time to just be a horse. Yes. <laughs> that, that is what we're all about, especially with the socialization. I think the socialization is so important. So we really try to find the groups of horses that get along and they won't hurt each other and, and stick with those groups and, and let everybody, and, unless we do have one horse right now who is, um, I think he was gelded late. And so he's just kind of nasty to everybody. And so he has to live by himself. But other than that, <laughs> has has buddies all the time. But Shelly is a huge proponent of turnout. And mm -hmm. I think Ingrid Klemke, who said if she couldn't turn her horses out, she wouldn't own them. And our horses, yeah. my horses now, they come in, they eat, they exercise. They're around the barn and exercising for a couple hours. And the rest of the time, they're out in pastures with their friends. That's other great. Other than he was on his own. <laughs> he's so in a Adam, large pasture but he's on his own <laughs> Adam, tell me um what you feel is the responsibility of the rider or the trainer um with a sport or a show horse what's 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 their role or their responsibility there so that, that's a great question because when we're in the moment of competing and really going all out whether it's you know a five-star event or the u.s open finals or what have you I think we have to let go and really trust what we're what we're on. And we've already put that foundation into our partnership with that horse. And so we really can't be thinking a whole lot about them. We need to be thinking about performing the task at hand. So I believe what our responsibility is to choose the right people. I'm talking about the veterinarians, the groom, the farrier. So that when we do, we're giving the horse everything before we do go into the competitive arena. And then we can trust that we've done everything and given the horse everything we can to basically perform freely and do our job together the way it was meant to be performed. Megan and I were talking but, um, before you guys joined us about our um, individual careers in the show ring. And one of my favorite trainers your uh, horse knows his job just stay out of his way yeah <laughs> With, <laughs> just there's, trust him he knows exactly what he's doing <laughs> totally there's a freedom and a fluidity to it and you already have this sort of combination with your animal and it's um, I try to look and play so it's just like not even think about that second nature my connection with my horse but I am able to have that trust because people like Shelly Back at the barn, I know the horses are eating what they need to eat, that they're exercising, that they've been legged up properly, that, you know, that little scratch on the side of the shoulder was taken care of, that, you know, everything is there so that we can fully trust and perform and be mm -hmm. in the moment of, of performance and competition. And that, yeah. that I find that it's so important to have the people behind you in the barn so that you can go out there with a trusting mindset. So and I'm gonna, that's what I, sorry, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I'm going to deviate for a minute. I think oftentimes people who aren't familiar with the polo world um, have preconceived ideas that um, the person riding the polo pony doesn't own the polo pony, doesn't work with that polo pony. They've, they've catch ride, so to speak. Talk a minute about the polo world and how many of the horses that are used are sort of the string that, that the teams use versus those that, like you've got that are your own yeah. horses. Right. So for the first five or five years of my career, I think I played, I didn't have horses coming out of college. I couldn't afford them, but I was a good enough player that people were inviting me to play on their string of horses. So I was being hired by a sponsor that would have 12 horses. He'd play six and I'd play six. But I very much treated those horses. I knew them well. I um, felt like I was responsible for them, even though I didn't own them. Um, but then 
as I transitioned into owning my own horses. And today it's much more common that the professionals own their own horses. Mm. But when I was beginning in the late eighties, early nineties, I was sometimes mounted by the teams I was playing for. And it was out of necessity, my first four or five years out of college. Otherwise I couldn't have afforded to play. Um, but I had, um, so today, most of the high gold players in Florida and in Argentina, and even when they go to England, are playing their own horses. There's still a couple okay. really big organizations that mount their professionals, but it's um, it's rare today. Hmm. Huh. Good background. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I, I love, I'm living in Lexington. I loved watching, going and watching polo on Sundays and everything at the Kentucky Horse Park. If anybody's ever ever there during the summer, I highly, I highly recommend it's a, it's fun to tailgate and watch and watch the sport and see some true athleticism from the horses to the riders themselves. Thank you. We just got back from there because Shelly competed in the AECs with her event horse river dance. And we had a wonderful time up there. We love the Kentucky horse park. Yes. And it yes, was definitely going on once one day we were there. Oh, now, so I'm going to have to say kudos to you, Dr. Shelley, because I think you vendor people have a whole different <laughs> frame of mind when I watch you guys go. I'm like, oh, we. <laughs> They're brave. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. I wanted to ask Dr. Shelley, kind of the same respect as what we asked Adam. Um, Dr. Shelley, what do you feel is the responsibility of the veterinarian with sport and show horses? I love how Adam said that as a trainer and as a professional, you really rely on your supportive cast. You rely on your veterinarian and, you know, your grooms and your owners and everybody helping you out back at the farm to make sure that the horses are 100%. So that makes the veterinarian a, a key entity to the care, of course, to the sport horses and show horses. But what, what else do you feel is the responsibility of the veterinarian to make sure that these horses are happy and healthy competing? Yeah, so that's a really easy thing to do when you have a consistent and long-term client that you have a really good relationship with. Mm -hmm. Because then you can just have really honest conversations. You can say, I really think that you need to rest this horse. I don't think you should go to this competition. And they'll believe you because you've done it three other times. And two times you said you can go and it was fine. And then one time you said, no, you can't go this time. And they'll be like, okay, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's a much more difficult situation if you're coming in and you don't know, you know, if you're not, um, have a good relationship with the barn or, a, or a long-term relationship, or you're coming in for like a second opinion or that type of thing that can be a little more difficult. And so, you know, and legally we really are responsible to our clients who are yeah. people. They're not the horses. And, and, you know, our Hippocratic oath is, is to obviously take care of the welfare of the animal um, but legally we're really bound to do what the clients want us to do when, which for me, um, is, um, very rarely have I, since I'm mostly an acupuncturist, mm -hmm. um, very rarely have I said no to do something because most of the time you can't really do much harm with acupuncture. There have been a few cases where I have said, no, I'm not going to do that because I felt like they were trying to mask pain or mask something to go and compete. Um, I mean, if you're a more traditional veterinarian and you're doing joint injections a, a lot or something like that, or doing mesotherapy or things like that, then I think it really is problematic because you um, are being asked to do things by clients that you um, are getting paid to do, and that's your job, but yet you know that um, it might not be really in the long-term benefit of the horse. And that's a big thing. Things. I, I really like to think of long-term thinking on these horses. They're um, not only um, because they are valuable financially, but more really because they deserve that being a living being and in their own, you know, selfhood. And, um, but unfortunately, a lot of, of showing um, does revolve around, you know, getting things fixed quickly. And there are a lot of really sad stories to do with that. Um, so, yeah. But I, I guess I'm a little fortunate. Um, and, and it's probably one of the reasons, honestly, that I am doing what I'm doing because I, I'm ethically 
um, comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. I can. See I know that. in the book you mention um, that sometimes we ask we have to ask ourselves some hard questions uh, when we're trying to maintain an athlete. Um, talk to us a minute about some of those hard questions. I, I know, for example, um, people are really reluctant to make a retirement or an estate mm-hmm. plan, you know, and and that translates to the people part, but it also <clears throat> applies sometimes to the horses because it's time for them to retire and you need to have a strategy. But talk a little bit about those hard questions. What are some of those? Well, um, sometimes when Shelly wasn't with me, I'd have a dilemma about a horse and I lost that element of trust because even though there was a veterinarian assessing them, I didn't have the same connection with that Mm. vet. They didn't know the animal for years the way Shelly did. And they also don't understand my sort of personal goals and balance them naturally or or instinctively Mm -hmm. with the competitive, with the equestrian long-term health goals. Um, And there was a situation that I write about in the book that I was out in Santa Barbara. We'd made the finals of the Pacific Coast Open, which is the biggest tournament of the summer out there. And my best mare had a little bit of a change on the tendon. I'd had to go home to take the kids back to school. And (laughs) uh, the veterinarian out there um, had ultrasounded her, thought she was okay to play, but I just didn't feel right about it. And Shelly's like, you know, go in that stall and really put your heart in your hand and feel it and try to sense how tequila's feeling. And um, I ended up playing her. Um, She didn't break down. She didn't injure herself. But I played her, I realized, without that level of trust. And we went into that final chucker, two goals up. I played tequila because she was my best horse, but I was playing her scared and doubting Mm -hmm. and we lost by a goal. And I learned this big lesson that I'm, you know, better. Well, A, that when Shelly was with me, how much I trusted her decision. So if she said, yes, she can play, I would have played her all out, flat out. But since I was making the call myself, um, I I didn't have that level of trust. I would have been better playing, you know, a not as talented a horse, but all out with a trusting because mindset. he has the seed of doubt in his head. Then yeah, it's hard to, like give yourself, you know, to to the competition. Just kind of cut touches back on what he was saying earlier. It's like, you know, at really high levels of competition, like especially in a sport like polo or eventing or racing, where they're dangerous. It's like you've got to um, be a hundred percent focused on your job at hand as the rider in those situations to keep yourself and your horse safe. Right. So you having these niggling doubts of like, Oh, my horse is not quite right. You know, it's not, it's not a good way to proceed. So, yeah. Yeah. And I can so see the same him thinking him being concerned, not only for himself, but also having that niggling little doubt makes him concerned about how hard do I push my horse? Because, you know, exactly. I love this horse. I want to take this horse home with me. <laughs> yeah, Exactly. Because exactly. right. you're worried about the horse. And mm-hmm. then you don't, how can you compete if you're not, if you're worried about the horse? You know, it's, it's very hard to. I mean, there's only a very small number of times. Fortunately, I can count them on one hand or less. But the times that I've made a decision that has hurt one of my horses are probably the times that I feel the worst and you know in my mm. all the years that I've been caring for horses not intentionally of course yeah, but, not in, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get that, get that. but I okayed an injection of an ankle in my last U.S. Open in Florida and that was also I was not there she wasn't there <laughs> no no she straight back to work she can play on Friday I'm like are you sure we always give them three days off and um anyway it went septic and so there are regrets with um, you know, making the, but every time or each time, not many, but the decisions, what's it called when a human makes a decision that hurts a horse intra? Oh, iatrogenic. Iatrogenic, um, <laughs> you know, mistake is probably the most painful for me. Um, I just, it's terrible because they're giving us everything. And yeah. the least that we can do from our side is give them everything. You know, it's, love and food and the things that are important to them, uh, social with their friends and security and knowing that we're not going to hurt them. Mm -hmm. Um, so 
Yeah, but mm-hmm. I can also sense that there were some lessons learned through those experiences, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, for sure. And we try to be learning every day. Um, I think that's one of our philosophies as well. And, you know, so innovating, learning, keeping it natural and trying to combine those things in our own philosophy. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, and it, it's definitely, it's so important to have those conversations with yourself when you're thinking about your horse and when it just might be time to retire or just maybe time to move on and on. I think, I think um, addressing those in, in your book is really, is really special and, and uh, important for any horse, right? Even if you're not competitive and all and you're learning when it might be time to move on to a different horse or, or something like that. I think that really comes down to just being in tune with your horses and, and mm-hmm. tell you basically um, through their behaviors, through, um, their physical well-being, um, and so I do try to help my clients with that. It's um, you know, there's obviously some decisions that have to do with end of life, uh, as far as when to put a horse down, mm-hmm. and, and that really, um, I think veterinarian is really important. It's, it's a really important thing for a veterinarian to help clients um, work through those and try to help them decide when it that is appropriate or not, and. And then as far as, you know, um, moving on to, you know, a lower level in the same sport, like we um, will sometimes retire our horses from playing under Adam, which is a pretty high stress um, environment to going and playing kids polo, for example. And, and, um, and it's amazing how the horses like just immediately they might have been nervous at the trailer when they were at polo with Adam. And then when they're with the kid, they're just like, everything's great. You know, <laughs> just they understand pressure yeah. and they understand pressure has been removed basically. Um, and that would be the same thing with jumping horses or event horses. You know, they can go and start teaching the next generation type of thing. Um, and then of course, sometimes our horses are um, uh, used for breeding because a lot of them are mares. And then also they generally, a lot of our polo ponies and polo ponies in general make great trail horses just because they're mm. so, um, used to everything. And, um, so they can be used for that too. Yeah. That's, that is so cool. I love it. Um, how about the questions for the writer? Um, you know, is there, is there a time, um, that you really kind of start questioning? I know Adam, you, you retired competitively, um, but it sounds like you're still playing, um, and, and keeping up with everything, what are some of the tough questions that writers besides, you know, end of life discussions with your horse, but writers for yourself that you guys address in your book? So I always had it in the back of my mind that I was going to stop playing tournament polo by the time I turned 60. And I, um, in the spring of 2022, um, had a couple falls and I was 58 and Shelly and I went to a Mexican restaurant after my second fall and just had a real heart to heart. And I was already had it in the window of sometime over the next two years. I want to be proactive about my retirement, not reactive. And I've had Mm -hmm. enough friends and peers that have had to be reactive, unfortunately, because of accidents. Um, And so uh, it was, actually easier than I would have expected because I made the decision that night, picked up the phone, called two sponsors that I was committed to play with and explained the situation. They both understood and I shifted from a playing role to a coaching role and found substitutes. And then as a result of having more free time, I've been um, kind of uh, available for all these other opportunities that have come my way, uh, whether it be coaching or announcing or I was the horse master last winter last fall in Florida for the uh, FIP international tournament and so it feels like um, I'm still able to give back in the sport maybe even more so than with my playing into my late 50s and I'm still playing pro-am polo and coaching league polo so I'm still getting plenty of the sport and giving plenty to the sport um, but um you know, stepped away from in the trenches tournament polo. Awesome. Awesome. So just to kind of close our, our interview here, if you will tell, tell our um, 
listeners more about uh, where to find the book uh, and what to expect from the book? Well, our website is horsesandsport.com, and you can also find it on our publisher's website. Um, well, that that would be learning more about us. You can buy the book at our publisher's website at um, Horse and Rider Books, mm-hmm. um, or on Amazon, or any um, number of hopeful uh, bookstores. You could find it. Um, and what we hope that people will learn from our book is some, some more of what we have been talking about today, but with some of the details about how you can go about um, improving um, the win-win situation with yourself and your horse at both the competitions and at home. Great. Thanks so much, guys. We really appreciate it. And everybody, uh, please uh, take an opportunity to check out this book. We think it's got some great stuff in it and that you will really not only enjoy reading it, but you'll take away a lot from it. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Dr. Shelley. Thank you, Adam, for joining us. Thank Pat? you. For great yeah. questions. Here's some great reasons why your nonprofit should become a member of the United Horse Coalition. Through industry collaboration, the United Horse Coalition promotes education and options for at risk and transitioning horses. Incentives for joining include access to a home for every horse training portal and other educational materials and programs, assistance with promotion. Networking with industry professionals. Free listings on equine.com. Purina feed coupons. Join as a nonprofit or as a support organization. Become a member of the United Horse Coalition today. Find out more at unitedhorsecoalition.org slash become a member. So, Megan, um, I want to share with the listeners a new development on the legislative front. So the American Disabilities Act has not traditionally defined miniature horses as service animals, but they are getting ready to make some changes to those rules. And we're really excited about this. Um, But there are some conditions. Not just any miniature horse can necessarily be qualified as a service animal. So just like a service dog or other type of, of animal that is in service, they have to have some training to do the specific job they do. Um, they have to be housebroken. You can't take them on the plane if they don't meet some of these requirements. And um, what they say is that the regulations do not define a miniature horse, but the guidance traditionally says miniature horses are generally in the range in height from 24 inches to 34 inches, measured to the shoulders, and generally weigh between 70 and 100 pounds. So that's the that's sort of where they start this. But I was so um, interested at, in the fact that they've written out specific criteria, like the type, size, and weight of the horse um, has to be able to be accommodated, um, whether the handler has sufficient control over the horse, whether it is housebroken, um, and whether the horse's presence in a specific facility compromises any legitimate safety requirements that might be necessary for safe operation. So I don't know the exact date that this will go into effect, um, but we have reached out to the American Miniature Horse Association and a number of other groups who use miniature horses a lot, um, especially in equine assisted services uh, facilities and others, to get their input and comments so that we can submit um, a letter of um, support for this, but also to express whatever concerns um, groups might have about this. So more to come, listeners, about this, Mm -hmm. but uh, look for that, uh, we hope, in the not-too-distant future. I think I think it's fun, and as somebody who owns a miniature horse and whose daughter shows miniature horses, it's it, you know you sit there and you think that they are kind of like big dogs and that type of thing. We've brought Gru into when my when my parents were alive, and we we brought Gru, my daughter's miniature black miniature horse, into my parents' house to visit my dad when he couldn't make it down to the barn and stuff, and just kind of thinking to myself, you know. That could be Gru someday walking into, you know, a nursing home or something like that. But it's just funny when people there's see their eyes light up. And I think this is a this is a real positive change. I just hope that it's that there's some good um, you know, regulations and that people follow those regulations and you don't get into some of the dirty, you know, shadowy kind of things, you know, like people do with dogs to get on airplanes and stuff like that. So it'll be interesting to see. And of course, you can keep up with where that all where that legislation is going on our website and our social media channels. 
Yeah, um, I can tell you that um, in equine assisted services facilities, they use a lot of miniature horses, but they mostly use them in nursing homes or mm-hmm. hospitals or other kinds of outreach or community kind of things. So there's lots of places where miniature horses go today, even though they're not even clearly defined as service animals already. But this is going to make it a lot easier to to use them um, in, a, in a number of sort of emotional support or or, or other types of ways. So mm-hmm. we're looking forward to seeing how this plays out. Very cool. Very cool. Well, we want to thank you guys for joining us today. I think there was something that everyone can take away from our conversation with Adam and Dr. Shelley, and you can find out more about them and and their, both of their books on their website, which is horsesandsport.com. And we'll have a link on our show notes below. And Winning with Horses is published by Trafalgar Square and can be found on their website, horseandriderbooks.com. In Trafalgar Square, we have a great relationship with them. So we thank you so much for uh, for their support. And Megan, I want to give a little uh, shout out because we've got a couple of great upcoming episodes. So let me talk mm-hmm. a minute about that. Yes. We're going to hear from the American Horse Council's Marketing Alliance. So Jen Grant from Zoetis. And Christy Landwehr with the National Reigning Horse are on the Marketing Alliance. They're going to talk about the new campaign the Marketing Alliance has kicked off called Here for Horses. And we're really excited. It's got a new website, so go check that out. We're offering the general public ways to experience horses or to see horses. And uh, we're really looking forward to um, sort of a, a bigger PSA, if you will, about that. So look to hear from Jen and um, and Christy uh, in an upcoming episode. We also are going to have a PhD student at the University of Florida, which is Caitlin Loonsman. And um, Caitlin recently completed her master's in agricultural education and communication. And her thesis was titled Horsepower. How Young Equine Experiences Impact Authentic Leadership Development. And I have seen and heard this presentation, and it is really powerful. I'm excited. The study focuses on how horse association members' equine experiences throughout their lives from youth to adulthood and how those experiences have impacted their authentic leadership competencies, including self-awareness, balance processing, ethics and morals, and relational transparency. So this is going to be a really great uh, presentation. So look to hear more from from Dr. Caitlin uh, in an upcoming episode. Yeah, I'm excited to hear and talk with Dr. Caitlin because that's, you know, the, that's kind of stuff that's right up both of our alleys and everything. And I think a lot of people will, will definitely... Um, We'll definitely get something out of that. So, yep, definitely. We're excited to be wrapping up the uh, 2023, which is crazy, which is crazy to think with some great episodes coming up. So we hope you guys tune in on the first Tuesday of every month. So we want to invite you to join the American Horse Council and get subscribed to our monthly newsletter, which shares the latest in all our legislative happenings, whether it's federal or state, as well as information that horse owners uh, like you need to know about. Yep. And follow along. The American Horse Council is on social media. You can look at becoming a member of your local horse council to help support your beloved industry locally as well as nationally when you join AHC. You can subscribe to Horses in the Morning on any podcast player and find all the shows, including ours, on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. And as we like to say, hashtag here for horses. See you next time. Thanks.